Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com and the associated website. So information, resources, activities and so on for people who work across the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, uh, medical publishing and the associated businesses. Also, um, we do quite a lot for people who would like to know more about our business. Maybe you want a job as an account manager or a, med a medical writer or whatever. You'll find a lot of information at firstmedcomsjob.com. So lots of things to go and have a look at. Specifically, we run a lot of these webinars, uh, record them, um, and you'll find they're all over at Network Pharma TV, where there's now, um, we're heading for 500 videos, mostly uh, based around these sorts of webinars. So there's a lot of useful resource to go and have a look at. Um, Absolutely delighted. And the beauty of this technology is we can bring people in from all over the world. We've got a good international audience again today, which is great. Um, but importantly, we've got a couple of panelists coming in from the US. So thank you very much, guys, for getting up early and joining us. Um, Larry and Beth are going to talk about um, HUR communications writing. Um, I won't steal your thunder. I'm going to hand over to Beth to kick us off with the uh, with the first presentation. And then we'll go on to a QA. and a So members of the audience, be prepared with some questions and some comments. Over to you, Beth. Thank you. Um, hoping everyone has a good day so far for those in the US, uh, wishing you a great start to your day. My name is Beth Lesher. Uh, my background is in pharmacy. I have a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and a shout out. I saw someone from Ohio. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, at Ohio Northern University. I did my PharmD work at the Medical University of South Carolina. So again, a shout out. I saw some, some people joining us from South Carolina. I then uh, worked as a clinical pharmacist in critical care for numerous years before in being introduced to medical writing. And for about the last 20 years or so, I have focused on medical writing. When I started in medical writing, HEOR was at its infancy. Um, and I didn't realize at that time how far I would go in this field. So um, I started working on dossiers um, and then that has grown into HER, other HOR deliverables like publications and posters. Um, I began freelancing for Pharmerit International. Uh, Pharmerit has now joined with the Open Health Group. Um, when I joined, I was about the first HOR dedicated medical writer. We now have about 10 uh, people in the evidence and access side, a bit different from where Larry sits, that focus on HEOR writing. Um, uh, lastly, I mentioned I got into this by doing dossier work. I currently sit on the AMCP format committee. And uh, while we do dossier work, uh, we also do other HEO offerings, like I said, such as publications and also value decks. So looking forward to a lively discussion today. Larry, I'm going to send it to you. Great, thank you, Beth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's uh, nice to be with you all today. I'm Larry Radekin. Um, I have a uh, my PhD in epidemiology and master's in public health and going way back, an undergraduate degree in economics when I didn't know what exactly I was gonna do with that uh, degree in economics, but I found my way by uh, chance and serendipity and a little good planning as well. So. Um, I've been in the HOR field for about almost 30 years now, uh, including over 22 years at Merck at the Center for Observational Real World Evidence, where I worked 18 years global and about four years US. Uh, Evans Generation doing the uh, cost effectiveness studies, the budget impact models, the real world data study. So I've been in the evidence generation side of the business for a long time. And I came to Open Health about five years ago, uh, heading up a, a publications team here in the communications part of the business. Um, and it's been a fantastic, amazing uh, experience for me, a learning experience about the art of communications. Um, and ours is a, uh, our field of HOR is, is massive and expansive and broad, as we all know, all the diverse methodologies we um, work with uh, and being able to communicate them effectively to the diverse audiences that we uh, target our messages to is, uh, is really quite, quite the challenge. So, uh, but it's wonderful to work with uh, experts like Beth, who's been in communications for a long time and all the people on my team. I have a fantastic team, about uh, 11, 12 writers, directors uh, who are experts uh, in what they do. So. Um, a little bit about Open Health, just briefly. We're a, a global HUR uh, uh, medical uh, communication consulting agency. We have about 1,300 employees 
around the world, 16 different locations, over 250 um, pharmaceutical companies of various sizes that we provide support for, some, some of the smallest companies out there to the very largest companies. And with that comes a great diversity in the types of uh, communications uh, needs that they have. Uh, and we have over 20 years of experience. Beth had mentioned um, Farmerit International, which is the evidence generating aspect of the business, but we also have a long history of medcoms as well, publications with a company called Peloton Advantage, and we came together with other open health companies. So um, our centers of excellence include omni-channel medical communications uh, and HUR market access. So Beth resides in the uh, HUR market access part of the business where we do market access strategy, real world evidence, data analytics, PCO, patient-centered outcomes, patient engagement, as well as health economic modeling and meta-analysis. And where I reside in the communications part of the business, we do publications, medical affairs, strategic scientific communications, learning and development, as well as patient-centered communications. And then we have a whole omni-channel group, very creative group that does data-driven creativity, brand creative strategy, omni-channel strategy, and campaign development and measurement, which is far outside my area of expertise. Uh, so we have a great group that does that as well. So thank you again for joining us today. What we're going to cover is what we call the ins and outs of strategic value communications, HUR writing. Uh, the ins or the inputs, uh, getting us started, basically asking the right questions. And then the outputs uh, include providing a critical background for the introduction, elucidating the methodology, reporting results with clarity, uh, creating a very engaging discussion, properly acknowledging the strengths and limitations, of what we do, and then really hitting home with a very concise and convincing conclusion so that the reader of the manuscript, abstract, poster has what Beth and I like to say, that aha moment where they get it, where they see it, where they see the value, where they see the unmet need. So the ins, um, it really all starts with asking the right questions right up front. Um, we always think about diving right into a, into a project, but really it's important that we step back and that we ask the right questions. And very importantly, in the field of health economics outcomes research, uh, we often like to think about HUR as its own entity, and it certainly is, and it can reside within clinical, within medical affairs, within other groups, within, within companies. But, the important thing is that HUR is not an island, it's not a silo, that we work very closely with our medical affairs colleagues, with, with uh, regulatory affairs, with clinical, um, with market access, um, and that we come together at the beginning of a project and that we sit together, we ask these questions together, and not only do we ask the questions, but we answer the questions together as a team. So Beth and I are huge advocates and proponents of really HUR uh, being part of a systematic approach within a company in terms of how we address the unmet need communications and value communication needs of the organization. So the very first question is, who is your target audience? To whom are you really uh, driving these messages of value? Do you want it to be uh, going to patients, to payers, providers, policymakers, the four P's as we call them, regula regulators, patient advocacy groups. There's a, really a lot to think about in terms of who you're crafting this message for and who your target audience is going to be. And it's very important to really give thought and consideration to this. And you could have more than one audience, that's fine, but you might have a predominant audience and then a secondary audience. Maybe it's more payer audience, but you also want to hit the with the, um, with the provider audience as well. So it's just really important upfront to think about who your target audience is, because that will impact the actual writing process, the nature of the value narrative that you construct, and also the conferences and journals to which you submit your, um, your publication. Now, what is the message that you wanna convey? That's the second most important question is, what is the narrative? What is that value story, the value proposition that makes the stakeholder at the end of the set, day say, Aha, uh -huh, I get it. Is the message focused on clinical value, morbidity, mortality? Is it economics? Is it, you know, reductions in healthcare resource utilization, improvements in work productivity? 
uh, and or uh, is it humanistic outcomes? Is it more the quality of life, work, family, social function type outcomes and messages that you want to convey? Um, also, it's very important uh, with regards to the methodology. And I start out by saying our world of HUR is broad, massive, and expansive, right? We have retrospective, cross-sectional, prospective methodology, simulation methodologies, primary data collection studies, secondary data, database studies, EMRs, claims, et cetera. You all know these, uh, these, uh, these methodologies extremely well. And when we think about all this, we have to think about how we're gonna communicate uh, the messages from those diverse and complex methodologies that have a lot of inherent strengths as well as limitations. And Beth will talk about those uh, later as well. So the next important um, question is where? Where do you want to go to in terms of your publication? Um, uh, do you want to go to a medical conference? Do you want to go to more of an HUR conference or both? Do you want to go to a medical journal or more of an HUR type journal? Um, and these are very important considerations because it's related, uh, highly correlated to the uh, target audience, to, to whom you want to get this message across around unmet need and product value. Um, the target audience to which the SACO will be the most ap applicable and relevant, that's very important to, to consider. And also the type of data that you want to present. Is it more epidemiological data, clinical outcomes data, quality of life, direct medical costs, um, switching treatment patterns, things like that. Really giving strong consideration and thought uh, to the type of message because that will dictate where you want to go to. Again, if it's more of a clinical outcome, maybe you go to more of a medical journal. If it's more of a healthcare resource utilization, direct medical cost, maybe you go to more of a, a health economics and outcomes research type journal as well. And we've also discovered in the recent past that the type of methodology can dictate as well where we can be successful in terms of targeting our publications. So some of the more newer methodologies, I use uh, air quotes for the newer methodologies, but like matching adjusted indirect treatment comparisons. Um, you know, there's, there's less understanding in the peer review, um, uh, in, in peer review journals about these methodologies. And you have reviewers review them sometimes, and it, uh, it's, it comes across pretty clearly that they may not fully understand the methodology. They haven't used it before. They get it conceptually, but um, so we need to think about where we target the methodology. Is it a straight database study, an EMR claims, uh, a descriptive study change from baseline comparing two groups, um, or is it some sort of more complex methodology? Um, where, excuse me, when do you present and publish your results? And, and Beth will go through this in more detail. Um, she has a slide, but it's very important that we think about the strategic planning that goes into value communications, okay? When we think about phase two, what's going on in terms of burdens of illness studies and epidemiological type studies, patient report outcome measures are being developed and validated in, in phase two. And it's very important that uh, for HT agencies that those, uh, those patient report outcome measures are tested, validated, and published in the peer review literature so that that has to happen very early up front and so that they can be used in the phase three program. So HUR, if you're starting the thinking, the thought process around phase three, it's probably too late. Uh, we know that it really has to go back a number of years in terms of that strategic value communications planning and the evidence generation planning, of course, that goes along with it. In phase three, we're doing the real world data studies, highlighting unmet needs and treatment gaps, the economic models. And then post launch, we get into the really fun uh, world of the comparative effectiveness research, the real world data studies, comparing our new treatment to the old treatments in real clinical practice, either retrospectively in an EMR or claims database, or following out a cohort patients over time in, over time in a prospective cohort study or registry. The, question that we need to ask, uh, and, and it's very important, is why should your reader care? Why should your readers care? And that's very important, you know, they, they're very busy people, the, the, the individuals who are reading these journals. They don't have a lot of time, right? We know that people are getting bombarded more and more with information, left and right, up and down. So how do we make it, how do we make it so that they say, 
aha, I get it. I see why this is important. I see why this is this this why I should care. Why this is critical. Um, it's important that we are very clear that we make the case that we're very clear um, and that it's watertight and it's really unequivocal and, and that uh, we identify upfront what the problem is, what the challenge is, what the issue is, so that they say, uh huh, I get it. I see it. I see how it's applicable to my everyday world in which I'm operating in. Um, how does the study or model demonstrate the, um, the, the, that about the problem, what the problem is and what the, uh, what the solution is in terms of this new intervention, what unmet need it addresses. And it's very important that we give reason uh, for the readers to believe in the methodology. That's very important. And again, as we said earlier, there are so many different methodologies that we employ uh, with many assumptions very often and, 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 and methodologies, techniques, like in database studies, you see propensity score matching, multivariate, mo multivariable models, uh, and other approaches to address for some of the potential confounding factors. And then how do we give the reader reason to believe and to care about the results? That's very important. Um, it's very critical to include sensitivity analyses, scenario analyses, so that they see the base case up front and then they understand that we have done a thorough job in terms of evaluating all the potential parameters within a model, within a study to see, okay, if you vary this, per, this assumption by X and Y percent, either via a probabilistic sensitivity analysis or a deterministic analysis, that, um, that the results are, are quite robust and that there's reason to believe in the, in the uh, accuracy of the results. Um, and it's very important that in our field that we don't oversell or undersell our results. Um, we're scientists, we're, we're communicators of science, and it's just very important that what we do comes across in a very balanced manner. And then finally, the last question that we have to ask ourselves is how? How do you concisely articulate and communicate product value? This is absolutely critical that we kind of lay out and map out this process. So it starts foundationally with what is the gap? What is the study? Why is the study or model being done? What's the information gap in the literature? And then how does the study model and method make this clear and it has to be very very transparent the process in terms of how we do it and what we do and the uh, effort that's gone into constructing the model into the effort that's gone into the database study or into the prospective cohort study or registry the value story must flow logically intuitively and really be evidence-based that's critical that we can we can show where the information coming is coming from, from credible, high quality sources, from, um, from electronic medical records, from claims databases that, have, uh, that we have a lot of experience in using, that the model that's been developed, the Markov model, the discrete event simulation model has been validated and tested. It's just very important that we, that we go through that process with the reader and we show them how that was done. The scientifically rigorous writing along with very um, uh, engaging uh, techniques like plain language summaries, PLS, we're, we're doing a lot more of those. Graphical and video abstracts, um, interactive appendices, something that we've developed here at Open Health. Good to go. I'm going to hand it over to Beth. Thanks, Larry. And we did get a bit of a breather there, so I was going to let everyone take a deep breath. Um, as Larry pointed out in one of his first slides with Albert Einstein, that all of the work he just talked about takes about 55 out of the 60 minutes um, of an hour. So I get to slow things down a bit uh, and we'll look at how to take everything Larry just talked about and, and put it into a deliverable uh, that people want to use and read. So if we look at outputs in general, those outputs tend to be publications. Um, and what we really need to do is take those critical questions that Larry identified and put them into writing. And we need to clearly state what our message is. Um, if we've asked the right questions, this next step is really uh, the easiest part of the process. I remember when I jumped into writing, my mentor said uh, about 90% of your work is up front and 10% is in the actual writing. So we made it through everything Larry talked about. You asked all the right questions. You asked who your audience is. Um, you figured out how you want to present your data, and we are now going to jump in 
and start writing. Um, in general, this is going to focus on writing a manuscript or a poster, you know, perhaps an abstract. Um, and it's very similar to other styles of writing that you have done. Um, so we've asked the right questions. We've talked with our clients. We know the right messages we want to com convey. And we're going to start and we're going to uh, begin drafting our introduction. And Larry, if you want to go to the next, the next slide. So obviously the introduction is key in providing the critical background for your study and it sets the stage. Now it needs to set the stage based on the audience that you identified. Um, what is the problem? You need to clearly state the problem you faced. Um, you need to um, set the, the backdrop for the unmet need that that problem uh, is going to, um, that your manuscript is going to address. When you do this, you may want to, as a writer, you may want to take a step forward and it may be easier to write your introduction, say, after you write your methodology and results. And as you're jumping into the HER field, that is something that oftentimes I will let my writers know, hey, start with your methodology, start with your results, and then come back um, to your introduction. One of the things, and I've just had this happen to something I am writing at, you need to set up your introduction to not only address your problem, but to make the reader uh, who you identified understand why that's important to them. Uh, I recently submitted a publication to a clinical journal and it was on a model and it came back to me and go, uh, some of the reviewer feedback was, as clinicians, we don't understand what is the relevance of this. So we had to spend a bit more time uh, explaining the methodology and why it's relevant and how it can be used in the introduction. Um, if we're going to a modeling audience or a health economic um, research journal, we probably don't need to spend as much time on that methodology, but we may need to include more information on the disease. So really, it's important that you take the time, identify that audience as, as Larry suggested, and then develop this introduction with that audience in mind. Also, the introduction is the, the place to begin developing your story. Um, when I jumped into this field about 20 years ago, people always were talking about what is the story, what is the star story, um, and I would get feedback and, and hearing that story word would just, I would start to cringe, but it is really of importance that you start developing your story and you bring the reader in so they understand why the study was done and what they should be able to find out at the end or by the time we get to the conclusions. Larry, next slide. So Larry talked a little bit about the methodologies that we see and obviously the next step in the writing process or maybe you jump into the methodology first when you're writing is elucidating the methodology. One of the things I like about HEOR writing uh, in comparison to when I did some more clinically focused writing is that there are an abundance of methodologies that we write about. Um, we can go from exploratory preclinical studies where we may be writing about a systematic literature review. We may be do some uh, um, early um, epidemiology modeling. We then may progress into more burden of illness studies. We may also include um, outcomes that have been piggybacked onto a clinical trial that we're focusing on. Larry previously mentioned um, PRO validation studies. We may be doing patient surveys to see what's important to them in the disease state. So I think elucidating the methodology, um, talking about the methodology and understanding that is important. And like I said, there's a, uh, a wide range of methodologies that you can end up writing about as an HEOR writer. I did wanna point out here, it is important to understand because you're dealing with a multitude of studies, what the guidelines are for reporting those studies. So the equator network is your friend, jump on board, look and see what's on, um, you know, what figures are recommended that you present for each of these methodologies. Make sure you're in line. Are you presenting the right inputs? Are you presenting the right outputs? Um, are you including the right statistical information? So it is important that you look at guidelines um, I also suggest at this point that you want to look at perhaps other studies that have been published using this methodology and make sure that you are being transparent as you develop the method section. Next slide, Larry. Moving on to results. Just as there are a multitude of methods, there's a multitude of ways to report results um, for HOR studies. I think it's important that you use a combination, as with any writing, a combination of text and figures. 
And also to take a step back and go into your introduction or go into your objective and remember what the question is and make sure that the results that you are presenting answer the questions that were posed. Likewise, I think it's important when you're presenting your re results to make sure you go back into the methodology and make sure that your methods are there to support, support the results that you want to present. Um, again, in the results section, uh, look at those guidelines, see what tables, see what figures are needed, see what the recommendations are, and make sure that your manuscript includes those at least at the start. Um, you may be bound by journal guidelines eventually uh, in terms of how many tables and figures that you can include, but make sure that you have the relevant ones. Also, go back to who your audience is. Um, some of these tables and figures may not be relevant to a clinician looking at them, but they may be relevant to an HDA uh, organization. Um, a clinician may not understand a willingness to pay figure. They may not understand a cost effectiveness playing figure. And if you want to include that in a manuscript geared towards clinicians, make sure that you include enough text to get them through from the start of the figure to the end. In addition to reporting the results with clarity, one of the other things that you can do with your results is look at alternative ways to present those results. So we are now seeing an increase in plain language summaries. We are seeing an increase in visual abstracts. Does it make sense to include a searchable appendix? Uh, with a publication. And these are all ways that you can enhance some of your HEO or writing, make it more clear to your audience and expand it to other audiences. Can you take results that you presented for an HTA or geared towards healthcare decision makers and make them more applicable to patients? Um, and we are definitely seeing that shift um, in HEO or writing right now. Uh, the next slide. Looking at the discussion, and I think as writers, this is always probably the most challenging um, part of developing a manuscript is getting your discussion right. I think it's important that you take a step back, go back to those original questions, go back to that original amount of information that you gathered with the ins, and then figure out how you can continue to develop your dis uh, the story in the discussion. Um, it's uh, your chance to interpret the findings, again, you need to interpret them with your audience in mind. Don't go into highlighting some intricacy of a model when you're geared towards a clinician, um, a clinical audience. Then you need to figure out how to put your results in context without, with what's out there. What was the unmet need that you identified and how did your study address that unmet need? Were there other similar studies out there that also looked at this and yours is different because they incorporated a different input? Is, is yours slightly different because they looked at a broader patient population? Were previous trials done uh, in small cohorts of patients and now you were able to expand those data uh, using a real world study and a database analysis. So now instead of having data on 50 patients, we're able to look at outcomes on 250 patients. Again, you need to go back and address the results, how they uh, address the issues you raised in your introduction. Um, one of the things I also think it's important, particularly when we are publishing um, studies on, uh, er, in, when a product is in earlier phases of research, is can we set up additional studies in the future that need to be done? If we're looking at a PRO validation study, can we say additional work on this uh, instrument needs to be completed in phase three studies. If we're doing um, a collection during a phase three trial, can we look at that and say additional real world data are needed to confirm these results? And then lastly, in the discussion, you wanna make the reader feel confident of your findings. If you're introducing a methodology, has this methodology been done in other disease states? Right now I'm working on an oncology product and, and we've presented a model. And while it hasn't been done in the disease state we're looking at, it has been validated in other disease states. Make the reader see why they should want to use the data that you just presented. Lastly, Larry, the next slide, please. And we end the discussion with strengths and limitations. And this I always uh, want to highlight. And I worked with an author one time and he said, it's really important that not only we focus on the limitations of a study, but we focus on the strengths. And I think sometimes it's hard to identify what the strengths are of your study. But if we look at our limitations and how we address those limitations, we can also identify strengths. Um, 
it is important to highlight the limitations right up front, not to hide anything. Um, uh, be transparent when you're presenting them. There may be uh, limitations inherent to the methodology. There may be uh, limitations inherent to the database that you use. So call them up. And like I said, make sure that you address how you um, minimize the impact of those limitations. And lastly, if we go, uh, and probably I think where we struggle after the discussion is finalizing your manuscript and hitting a home run with a concise and convincing conclusion. You don't need to repeat all of your results in the conclusion. Um, we don't need paragraphs of conclusions. What you want to focus your conclusion on is that 30 second elevator speech that you can give to someone standing in front of a poster that is walking through a filled conference hall stops by your poster and you can say, right here, this is what we did, this is what we found. Again, concise, short, impactful, um, and you wanna make sure that ultimately you leave, you leave the reader with about five or six words that they can use that address that first question that you identified and answered. Um, this will allow them to take the information that you see, um, that you presented, uh, understand how that objective was met and ultimately highlight the value that not only your study presents, but hopefully the, uh, the product that you are supporting addresses. So I think, Larry, I covered that pretty quickly, um, but uh, since I only needed to cover five minutes of our, uh, you know, um, of the process, like Einstein said, hopefully um, I hit all the uh, uh, main points. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, you know, just going back to your strengths and limitations there, Beth, I think that is a, a especially critical area uh, to acknowledge uh, bo both the aspects of the study or model that are the, the, the strong uh, components to it uh, and those where there are, there are limitations, um, uh, but the limitations themselves are not reason to not believe, but just reason to maybe look more into um, the, the approach that was done to address uh, the uncertainties in the model or the lack of data. So around sensitivity analyses and doing stratified analyses and, and doing different types of multivariable models with different levels of covariates included in the model. It's just very important that, that the analytics um, address those gaps and that our writing is very community, is very clear around what was done and transparency you you hit home with that that right there is, is just absolutely critical that we get that right and that it's that we put it out there and 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 then one last point I'd like to make and i was thinking about as you were talking about again some of the aspects of components that go into a discussion is um you know in 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 the pharmaceutical world it seems like you know there are the champions the advocates of rcts it's rcts or it's nothing or those who believe in real world data studies or it's nothing. And the way, uh, Beth, I think you and I would agree and the way we look at our philosophy is, it's really a, a world where both are critical that the information are, is actually complementary. that if you have uh, a phase three trial that shows a certain result and you communicate that effectively, the, obviously this high internal validity and then you do your real world data studies which may have less internal validity due to lack of randomization uh potential uh residual confounding after controlling for covariates but the more general the higher the greater generalizability external validity of of that research um and then in your discussion section uh talking about both the experimental evidence and the observational evidence together and then talking about, like Beth, we like to say the totality of the evidence and communicating effectively the totality of the evidence to your, to your stakeholders. So absolutely. So Peter, that, that is, um, that's our formal presentation. Excellent, thank you very much. And there are your contact details. So if you could lose the slides, Larry, we'll, um, we'll turn this over into a little bit of a Q&A uh, for a few minutes. And, and audience members that are here on the day, um, please use your chat box and your Q&A box to fire some questions at us. Um, and some of you have already started that, which is great. And we'll weave those into the conversation. And um, I'm going to kick off, Larry, um, specifically with yourself. 
um, a question that I'm always slightly intrigued about. You've got a team of, of medical writers essentially working on publications, yeah, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, I'm sort of intrigued, you know, what makes a good HOR medical writer? And I'm thinking, you know, if someone out there is looking at coming into medical writing, or indeed if someone's already in, in medcom, say, and looking to move into HOR, can you articulate what what you might be looking for um, in terms of what makes a good writer for your sort of work or what they might be thinking, well, this is one of my strengths. That's why I want to go forward in this direction. Can you articulate that? Do you see what I mean? Sure, absolutely. And then Beth, I'll hand over to you from your perspective. But when I think about uh, my team of writers and uh, just a fantastic uh, group of scientists and communicators of science, great people, um, the diversity of their backgrounds. They have backgrounds in, in health economics, applied health economics, um, other epidemiology, other related observational sciences fields. So there is some academic training that is helpful. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a requirement per se, because right. we have seen people who don't have that formal training who are absolutely fantastic writers. But um, I think one of the most critical uh, necessities is the is the passion for communication being meticulous being detail oriented um, and then having a strong desire to learn more and more um, about the broad methodologies and so you might have someone who comes in who has experience with markov models and discrete event simulation models and, and decision analytics and that's great but there's the whole world of, of cross-sectional research, uh, survey research and retrospective studies, EMRs and claims, and they may not have experienced in that. So they need to learn it and they need to read about it, learn it and take on the projects. Usually we start our writers with abstract, smaller projects, and then they work on the poster from the abstract and then eventually work on a big manuscript, right? The ultimate challenge, if you will, will in value communications. But I do find that it's just very important in, in terms of having some of the, the training, uh, the formal training, and then just a strong, strong desire to, to learn it, to immerse yourself in it, embed yourself in it, um, and then being very meticulous in your, your writing. Because ours is scientific writing. The attention to detail is important. Uh, the decimal point, the, you know, the, the word selection, um, you know, getting the facts absolutely right. Uh, it's critical. It's scientific communication. So that, that passion, that attention to detail is so important. You have that. Um, I think that will lend, be a, a great uh, uh, pathway forward into HEOR value strategic communications. Beth, how about you from your, your perspective? So Larry, I think you hit all the main points. First one, you don't need a specific economic background to get here. Um, you don't need a writing background. I'm not sure there's too many people that go to, um, you know, that begin their careers by saying, I want to be a medical writer, or more specifically, I want to be an HEOR medical writer. Um, Larry hit on a couple of the key points, attention to detail. Um, you may not need to understand the model. Uh, methodology, but you need to pay attention to the details and report them accurately, just as with any type of writing project. And then um, lastly, I think it's important to be inquisitive. You may not understand the methodology, but take the time, go to the guidelines, understand uh, the project that you're working on and why it was done, and then use your writing skills to clearly um, document that for the reader. So, Peter. Okay. Okay. Just, just picking up on you mentioned guidelines there, and this is this isn't an area of my expertise, so I'm hoping I'm not going to get this wrong. Um, but you mentioned, and Beth, it was you that was talking about Equator and the guidelines, and quite a lot. You you mentioned guidelines, but there are specific guide. I just wondered whether it was worth. I mean, Cheers is the one I, I think I know um, as as one of the main guidelines. You know, it, it, can we throw a couple of examples out that people can go and have a look at if they're interested in in the sort of work you're doing? Am I getting it right with Cheers? And wasn't that updated? Am I am I right or not? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So just for economic evaluations, the place I send people to is the Equator Network the because equator. they're basically all listed there. I think it's www.equator.com or if you do Equator net. Guidelines, dot net. Um, I probably I bookmark it and uh, or Google Equator and it, it comes up. But we have uh, some of the um, more popular ones that come to mind are, say, Prisma, uh, if you're writing about a systematic Prisma. literature review. Cheers for economic evaluations, um, strove for observational studies. Um, there may be, there's others out there, but I think those are the, the main ones that I, I use. 
Um, also, in addition to the guidelines, ISPOR has a lot of great information on their um, organization, uh, organization website. So those are two places that I would have people look at. Okay, Larry, and let me just... Just jump in and, and be absolutely clear on this because we got that one wrong. Okay, Beth, so equator-network.org. Let's make sure we get that right address out there. Okay, <laughs> for anyone who's trying to follow what we're talking about. Um, okay, so there's some good. So, so sorry, Larry, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I just want the, that many of the journals will ask for one of those checklists or, or to be to be included that you can show your, you know, the the the, uh, the specific requirement and the page number that it's on. You'll submit that along with uh, the manuscript. So more and more main, uh, journals are are actually requesting that information be submitted along with. So think about that as Beth said up front as your as you're developing the, the structure for your for your publication. Okay, um, just picking up a couple of questions from the audience. Carla came in with one. How, how do you respond? To, this is for you, for you Larry. Um, but have you got any answer to this? Which information gathering questions do you always ask now that weren't obvious when you started? Because you talked a lot about the importance of asking the right questions. On I guess Carla's basically saying, well, you know, what have you learned to ask that you wouldn't have thought of to begin with? Have you got a, something that you could respond with that? Um, sure, I, that's a great question. I think that uh, it's you know one of the most important questions is is really uh, the target audience. And it used to be you know ten years ago, twelve years ago that uh, the audience was really stratified. It was you know it was a payer audience or it was a, a, a provider audience or policymaker, patient. So, but really the world has evolved where. You know, different entities are 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 engaging, right? Um, from social media and then other plat other other um, uh, technologies, and so they're talking. So the HT agencies, the regulators, right? There was a day back again, you know, over a decade ago, where like the FDA wasn't all too interested in in real world evidence, health economics. Um, they had something called the Dama 114. It went back into, I think, the 1990s. And it was never very clear where they stood in terms of, of you know, accepting or utilizing or the willingness to consider uh, HUR data. But fast forward to 2023, the FDA had new guidance just a couple of years ago on, um, uh, on the use of real world evidence. They're incorporating it into decision-making uh, processes along with clinical trial data and regulators, EMEA, FDA, talking with HT agencies, talking with physician groups, uh, patient advocacy groups. So everyone's talking. And so the, that question of who your target audience is, is actually probably plural in this day of age. Who are your target audiences? And that's good. That's fine because the more people that can, you know, read your study uh, and and uh, and take in the results and apply those findings to their population, to the challenge that they face in everyday life, that's for the betterment of the patient ultimately. And that's why we do what we do, right? And with the evidence generation part, the evidence communication, because what we want to do is make a difference in the lives of patients. And, and on that note, and, and, and Beth, um... Let's, let's lead into that. I mean, patients are always part of the conversation now. Yeah, um, Armand's asking about patients as, a, as an audience for you. Am I being, am I, again, am I wrong in suggesting that maybe patients isn't going to be one of your main audiences? Um, typically, you're not, you're not communicating with patients. Yes, is that right? So I think if you if ask me that question today, I am going to sell, tell you you're 100% correct. I think we are on the forefront, though, of that changing. We okay. are seeing more and more interactions with patients. We are seeing more and more lay summaries being requested, yeah. sharing study information, say, via social media. So today, no, our patients, uh, historically, patients have not been our audience. But I do think within the next five to 10 years that our patient audience will be expanding um, due to access. Which Okay, which makes sense, and which leads into the the obvious question, which again is talked about a lot at the moment: is do you get patients or patient advocates or patient groups involved in the studies, the authorship, the uh, the review of the sort of work you do? Does that make sense? So, yes, and I think again we're at about the same point. Historically, patients have not been involved. We're now perhaps maybe involved. 
by participating in a survey. Uh, but we're now seeing studies taking this a bit further. And if patients are involved in the survey, they may also be one of the authors. Um, so I do think the patients are definitely becoming more involved. And I would love to see where we are three years from now, five years from now. I think it's going to patient involvement will grow exponentially. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. We probably ought to stop actually, but I just wanted to just come away a little bit from the publications area. Um, Kelly very early on was asking for specific tips for writing a value dossier. Just for the final couple of minutes or something, just talk a little bit about those sorts of projects. Uh, who wants to kick it off? I mean, Beth, would you like to kick it off and then Larry finish on that? Sure. Um, I started in dossiers. Uh, it goes back to what I said uh, when I started my part of the presentation. A dossier clearly needs to define that uh, product story. Um, and I think you need to be able to make sure that you can connect all the pieces um, that are prescribed for a dossier, like the burden and the uh, current treatment regimens and and clearly explain how you're going to impact all of that. What is the value that the product you're supporting is going to address? Um, and what is the cost for that? Perhaps it, uh, your product may be cheaper, um, perhaps it may be more expensive, but decrease say adverse events or decrease time in hospital. So um, it, again, it comes back to really writing a compelling, compelling story in the dossier. Larry, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, no, I, I agree fully. That's that's really what it's all about. It's you know, it's, it's taking the a reader on a journey of of acquiring information. Um, and I think one of the most important uh, components to it is foundationally starting with uh, establishing what the what the need is, what the gap is, what's what why is this study being this real world data study being done? Why is this model being developed? Uh, what's the problem? And I think that that if we can succeed there at that level, at that endeavor foundationally, that the model or the real world data study that emanates that comes forward from that uh, is more compelling. And we need to we need to create compelling uh, messages, strategic value messages that uh, the readers understand. Again, because like I said, they're being bombarded with information left and right, up and down. How do we capture their attention? How do we draw them in so that they have that aha moment at the end of the day? They say, I get it. I see the unmet need and I see the value of this new intervention that this company has, has, uh, has developed. Excellent. Okay. Well, on that final aha moment, let's draw a line because we are slightly over time. Um, members of the audience that are here on the day, don't rush away. We have got a few minutes and we can carry on answering a couple of questions. I know there are a couple of sitting there we can come back to. Um, but huge thank you, Beth and Larry. And, and I know, as I say, it's um, been an early start for you. So thank you very much for joining in. I think that was a very comprehensive presentation um, and made a lot of sense to me. Anyway, um, um, part of the fun of these webinars is encouraging people to connect. So can we just put the message out there to anyone today, but also watching the video? Um, you know, if you, if, you know, you, you're very happy to have people connecting with you via LinkedIn is the easy way. Um, you provided some contact details on the slide. So please, anybody watching this, if you've got any questions, do reach out. And um, if you're interested in what I'm doing, medcomsnetworking.com, you'll see lots and lots of stuff going on. I'm always happy to help. But for today, I'd like to draw the line. I'd like to huge thank you to Beth and Larry. Um, and if we can just give a quick wave as I stop the recording, that would be great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.